Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV, Charlemagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Man, one of the most necessary black men walking the face of the earth, man. Brother Jason Wilson. Welcome, brother. Shalom, brother. How you doing, man? How you feeling? Finally good to see you. You weren't here last time. I wasn't here last time. time. No, yes, not at all. Oh, you wasn't? No, no, I wasn't here last oh, wow, time. Wow, yeah. wow, 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 wow. Yeah, I was on the road. Wow. Yes, sir. So a pleasure to meet pleasure you, brother. Pleasure meeting you too as well, good mm -hmm. brother. Yes, sir. For people that don't know who you are, you want to just break down quickly what you do, who you are, mm -hmm. and some of your history? Well, yeah. Um, my name is Jason Wilson. I'm uh, an author of two uh, best-selling books, Cry Like a Man, mm -hmm. Breaking, uh, Fighting for Freedom from Emotional Incarceration. And my second book is Battle Cry, Waging and Winning the War Within. Mm -hmm. I'm also the founder and CEO of a nonprofit called The Union based in Detroit, mm -hmm. which uh, under its umbrella is the Cave of Adullam Transformational Training Academy, mm -hmm. where we help boys navigate through their emotions without succumbing to them in a world that's full of pressure. You know, you, you know, we didn't talk about this a lot last time. We did, mm -hmm. but not really. People don't know your background. Uh, and, well, if you, they've read your books, they know your background. But mm -hmm. how you evolved as a human and got mm -hmm. to the Jason Wilson we know. Like, you was in the street. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. wasn't. I never was a thug, but yeah. I hung around those who were in gangs in my community. You know, mm -hmm. again, it was, I didn't have a father. So, and my brothers, uh, two of them were murdered. Uh, well, actually, one at that time when I was younger, then my other brother moved to Texas. So I needed the camaraderie. And so I hung around everyone who was in the gangs, but I wasn't like actively in it. Mm -hmm. um, however, I risked my life many times trying to fit this mold of what it is to be a thug. Mm -hmm. And then uh, after losing a lot of friends uh, to, the vi to violence, and then more importantly, answering my call, to the most high that's when my life completely changed into the man that i am today do you remember the turning point like do you remember that 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 light bulb moment hmm. um yeah a young kid asked me that in new jersey uh mm -hmm. yesterday in orange new jersey like what it took for you to change mm -hmm. and it it took me almost dying twice and then those incidents being connected to prophetic you know uh words so mm -hmm. basically one time i was driving a good friend of mine's truck uh, at the time, he was the number one drag pick in the NBA. Mm -hmm. And he told me, he t his mother told him not to drive the truck, but he allowed me to drive it to go to the studio mm -hmm. because she said someone had to get in an accident. That someone was me. Mm. Wow. So when I was driving back from the studio, brothers, the, a car stalled right in front of me. And by the time I got up on it, it was a, I was driving a forerunner truck. And at the time they were top heavy. So when I went to swerve, the truck flipped over two times. Mm. Sunroof open, windows down, sounds blasting, and I survived. But what struck you me- You by is, yourself? Yes. So when he came into the emergency room screaming and crying like, dog, you know, you gotta listen. I'm like, dude, I'm fine. He just got me on this board just in case I have any damaged vertebrae. He says, no, my mother told me this was gonna happen and you gotta answer your call. But even then mm. I still didn't listen. So fast forward another maybe four years, I'm working for Coca-Cola and I'm talking to Nicole, who is my wife now, mm -hmm. and I'm upset, brother, because I'm working 12-hour days. I'm gifted in music and, and helping, mentoring young boys, but yet I'm in this plant all day. And so we're on the phone, and I said, uh, you know what? God ain't real, so don't tell me about praying or any of that stuff, because if he was real, why I'm in here wasting my life away? I can't even spend time with my daughter. I hang the phone up. Ten minutes later, I go, like every night, to unload the pallet truck. For the first time, the driver didn't lock the brakes on the, on the semi. Mm. I hit the back of the truck with my high-low, couldn't get on it first, back up, I'm angry, because I couldn't get on, then I hit it again, and I'm able to get on, but this time, because the brakes weren't chalked or locked, the bed of the truck pushed away from me, but I was leaving the dock. Mm. High-low falls, uh, two herniated discs, I fall off the high-low, the truck, the back of the truck was about to roll back on me, but the forks of the high low dropped down to stop the truck. Mm. And then my friend gets inside the high low to hit the brakes on that so it wouldn't crush me. At that point, I looked up to the sky and I said, Most High, I said, I never go against you again. Mm. Wow. And at that point, it was a 180. I went from listening to hip hop that was profane, whatever, you know, basically the soundtrack for how I was desiring to live to Fred Hammond. The very next day, you can ask my wife, and so that was the turning point. And then, you know, the blessings and the miracles, I can't deny, you know, literally we're trying to buy a house. We were getting married. The week before we had to close, 
the trucking company wanted to settle with me. And that's how we had the money to close on the house. Oh, wow. wow. And ever since then, brothers, I haven't looked back, you know. Uh, truthfully, you know, I'm a guy that just like keeping my hands to the plow. You know, this is a blessing that I have an opportunity to share what has happened in my life so it can inspire others. But I never desired any of the attention. I rather just the lights cut off and I do what I need to do. But then a friend of mine in jujitsu said, you know, if you're not in the light, brother, how are we going to see, you know? Mm. And so that convicted me, man. And I just, you know, walked my calling through obedience. And what got you into martial arts? Hmm. Always desired, you know, my father was in the same city, um, but wasn't actively in my life. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I desired to have that man, you know, teach me not only how to fight, every boy wants to learn how to defend himself. Mm -hmm. But it was, when you see the old martial art movies, you see the sensei walking along with them, mm. helping them throughout life. And I yearned for that. And I, I, I didn't have it. Even when I first started martial arts in my backyard, I didn't have a teacher. I kind of felt like David in the scriptures where the most high is testified as the one who trained him for war. Mm -hmm. But then after that moment, I started seeking going into martial arts schools. And it the challenge of facing your fears, you know, facing your anxieties, your insecurities, in sports, you can kind of hide from it. Mm -hmm. In martial arts, when a punch coming at you, a kick, an elbow, or someone's trying to choke you or take your back like in jujitsu, you got to be able to stay calm enough to be able to counter all of that. And so that journey just never stopped. Even now as a man, I still uh, have what we call a moment on the mat. Uh, we even have fathers who will get on, want to train in the cave and they'll break down crying because a certain technique or training take them back to a moment in their childhood where it's painful. So mm -hmm. with, with all the, the martial arts, mm -hmm. um, and martial arts is heavy training, right? Mm -hmm. You still were with the streets, so were you doing martial arts and then hanging with the street buddies? Well, because usually yeah, martial arts keep you in a in a place where you don't even want to do that. Well, when you're with the wrong people, mm -hmm. it, you know, you can have the wrong teacher as well, you know? Um, mm -hmm. But no, when you're trying to fit in, brother, you know, I was trying to be a clone, trying to fit in. Mm -hmm. But I had a good heart, man. Mm -hmm. You know, I never could uh, fit the suit of a thug, you know, and especially after I got the revelation of what a thug is, you know, mm -hmm. it's an acronym I created called A Traumatized Human Unable to Grieve. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at all of my brothers who really walked that walk, that's what they were because after you see one person get killed, then another person get killed, and this happens to you, and this happens, you st your heart starts to become hardened. Mm -hmm. Not because you desire that, it's because you need to do that just to survive the community you're in. And so, no, we didn't use, I didn't use martial arts to uh, hurt anyone or, um, you know, to, to rob people, but I know guys who, who have. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I look at martial arts not as just self-defense, but more so self-control. You mm -hmm. know, I tell my boys, you can't defend what hasn't been disciplined. And, and apply that principle in school and life, honoring your mother and your father, and you know, you'll find yourself on the right path. It's, it's interesting, right? Because you know, when I hear you tell your story, or I think about stories of evolution, like mm -hmm. you know, Malcolm X, or I think about anything that even, we, we've even been through. Mm -hmm. It feels like this generation of kids aren't getting the opportunity to make the same mistakes mm -hmm. that we did. Man, you hit it right on the head. We were, well, big shout out to uh, Orange, New Jersey. We were just there yesterday. Mm -hmm. Superintendent Abdul Salim Hassan. He was reading my book, Battle Cry. This brother is so active in the community, man. He has father groups, uh, book studies. And so uh, Brandon Frame of The Black Man Can, I want to give him props. He's the one put the screening together for the documentary. And Superintendent Hassan had my book. And they were like, yo, I can get the brother here. So we toured three schools. One of the main things, the theme we were talking about is that the boys didn't feel like they had enough grace to make a mistake. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so when a boy fears failure, he tries to play it safe. And as we know, the safe route for me, you know, my ultimatum, if I couldn't have made it in music, because I also was a music producer, I was going to sell drugs with my brother. Okay, because that was the quick way out. I can get money. He's a millionaire established in the street so I can make it happen. But to do things that's hard, like start a nonprofit, serve the community, uh, be able to bless uh, all my other friends with employment. Uh, my brother, Ron Lee Jr. has been with me my 20, 22 years. Mm -hmm. And so it, it was um, the boys, one young man I never forgot, uh, he started showing his emotions because it's hard to get boys to express themselves in a culture that tells us that crying is weak for men. And I said, you know, where's your father? And that's when everything started pouring out of him. And I always get to my knees to make sure they know 
I, I'm all in for what you're talking about, and I welcome your tears. And it's just like, man, I had to, it was trial and error, trial and error, learning, and he's not there. And the next thing you know, the other boys start opening up. And so in the cave, what we do, the first thing you learn when you come to the cave of Adullam is how to fall. So we teach you judo, but the life principle is if you know how to fall correctly, you can get back up no matter how hard someone throws you. In life, our boys fear failure so much that they clinch on the things that appear to be safe. And so they're not taking the chances needed to become someone that they really desire in their hearts. Mm -hmm. And so we give them the freedom to fail. We say the uh, uh, mistakes are our best teacher. The worst mistake is the one you didn't learn from. But like what he said, it's, it's difficult because, right, you know, we've all did things that we got in trouble for. Mm -hmm. But now if you look back at it, those things could have cost us our life. Mm -hmm. and, and not just life as far as dying, but put us in jail, gave us records, mm -hmm. put us things where we couldn't possibly go. And it's difficult now. And I was even thinking about this earlier when we were talking about the cops wearing the cameras. You know, we've all been pulled over. I know I have, I'm, I'm sure you have, where we pulled over and a cop gave us leniency. They can't do that now. They can't pull you over and say, you know what? Just get your ass home. Your mom's gonna get your ass home. I don't know what you was about to do. They can't do that now because that camera's on them. So almost they have to arrest you. And if they have to, they have to give you a warrant. So, or they have to, you know, put you in jail. So what do we do now? Because those kids have the right to be scared because they know that, you know, the stupid things that I did and we talk about money, mm -hmm. you had a little le leniency. There mm -hmm. is none of that anymore. Well, I, I work with uh, police officers again, you know, um, I, I tell the young ones that I, I mentor that you're stuck in fight or flight. As Soon as you punch that clock, you're in fight or flight. Um, and many of them have given young boys leniency. You know, just recently one of the cave parents called me. She lost control of her emotions because she didn't have her driver's license and insurance. One of my students, her son was like, mom, calm down. You can make this situation escalate. Just articulate what you're feeling, you know, explain to the officer what happens. And what was cool was a white police officer. Mm. And he says, look, ma'am, calm down. Everything will be okay. Just go home. And I just, I know everything is good. And he gave her leniency. Now, to your point about our boys being scared uh, for being pull pulled over, of course, watching all the traumatic events that mm -hmm. we see on social media, what happens to black men when we get pulled over, uh, that's what our training is for. Um, I want them to be able to make those mistakes in a safe space where it doesn't cost them as much as it would out there on the streets. Right. So when you practice this, or same thing with being emotionally stable or emotionally intelligent, when you practice exuding more emotions than being a protective provider and uh, pretty much that's it, or an aggressor if something is uh, threatening your family, when you start practicing being a nurturer or expressing sadness, uh, how many young men I know personally are in the grave because they weren't allowed to feel fear? Mm. I say, you know, you don't want to succumb to it, but you can feel it. And, and then when you feel it, it can keep you from making the wrong decisions and I had one young man who wanted to join the cave when I was in uh, Detroit public schools and he knew he shouldn't have went to this party, brother. And he went anyway. And the guys were jealous of him and they shot and killed him. Mm -hmm. And to see his father, the entire funeral, stand next to the casket, he wouldn't leave his son's casket. And it broke my heart because, I'm not gonna say his name, but he was a beautiful young boy. He actually told me when a kid, a handicapped kid was getting bullied in the bathroom and I went in and stopped it, but he wasn't praised for being kind. He wasn't praised for being compassionate. Our boys are praised for being killers, thugs. Mm -hmm. uh, one kid wouldn't claim that he was brilliant. He says, I'm just smart. He said, I said, why you could, won't, won't say you're brilliant? Because that just seems like it's another level. I said, you don't think you can attain that? He couldn't say anything. And what was interesting, brother, when I promised, I said, anyone in here can get their grade point up to a 3.0, I give you $100. And the principal of this one school says, we, we're going to do it. Do you know the brother shot their hands up? I said, because it's not that you can't do the work, it's the distractions that's right. keeping you from performing. So when you allow a boy to really express what he's feeling, the distractions, the father wound, the mother wound, not having adequate things at home to even... I mean, I had kids that had to sleep on the front porch, brother, because of the violence in their home. Uh, one kid, grades dropped because his clothes wasn't clean. Props to Principal Reggie Williams at the time. He bought a washer and dryer, and his grade point average went right back up. And so we have to be uh, comprehensive in our approach in raising uh, black boys. And, you know, again, as uh, uh, I say elders in this uh, community, 
you know, I speak for myself. I, I need to repent for even some of the music I produced. Mm. I'm pretty sure that uh, my music was theme music for people who robbed and beat people or uh, created a mis misogynistic mindset. And so I, you know, I, I repent for all that I've caused in, in my own community. You know, I, I love, I get reached out to a lot of, by a lot of rappers, and I love how they transform their lives into businessmen. You see Kevin Gates was up here speaking about oh, your man, book. That brother's a beautiful yeah. brother, and I, I would love to connect with him even more, but at the end of the day, if we don't denounce that behavior, mm -hmm. even though we become businessmen and, and like a nonprofit, I, uh, my wife and I run a beautiful nonprofit, but that wasn't always the case, because if not, our boys would say, okay, cool, I can do this, and then I'll be like Mr. Wilson later. But to your point, they have leniency, they just don't have the grace that we have. We don't have the neighbors anymore to say, hey, Charlie, man, I see what you're doing, you gotta mm -hmm. you know, stop acting that way. I don't have a neighbor that could tie my tie like I did when I grew up. Now you talk about the cave, for people that don't know what mm -hmm. that is, the they're cave just, of just Adel tuned in. Adelum, Adelum, yes. Adelum. The cave of Adelum, yeah. explain to people what that is. There's also a new film, but for people that are just mm -hmm. tuning in, we're talking to Jason Will, and they might not know, they hear you talk to the cave, or mm -hmm. somebody wanted to join yeah, the cave. Yeah. So to break down yeah. what that is, because uh, somebody might be confused <laughs> right yeah. now. So the cave of Adelum historically is where David ran uh, for his life. Uh, David in the Bible who fought Goliath and became the king of Israel. Mm -hmm. um, he ran to the cave of Adelum, which is, a cave in the city of Adullam. And uh, the story goes that 400 men who were distressed, discontented, and in debt came to him and he became their captain. And what's beautiful about that history is that the way these men came into that cave, they didn't leave that way. When they left, they were called mighty men of valor. So the cave of Adullam presently is a transformational training academy in Detroit. Uh, our mission is to teach, train, and transform uninitiated boys into comprehensive men, men of the most high, men who are physically conscious, mentally astute and spiritually strong enough to navigate through the pressures of this world without succumbing to their negative emotions. And, and uh, it, it got turned into a film because, I mean, the first time I got, uh, I heard of you, was a, it was a video that was going viral. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, you, was, you was teaching the brother to express himself, yes. you know what I mean, mm -hmm. through, through martial arts. And he was crying, but mm -hmm. you was coaching him through it. I was like, man, that's so powerful. And then is that how Lawrence Fishburne connected yeah, with you? Yeah, and so what's e even interesting about the video, mm -hmm. brother, because that happens a lot in our academy. So when it went viral, we had no idea what was going on. We had to shut our offices down for two days because wow. men were calling all over the world and crying to our women's staff. Wow. Like, I wish he was my coach, you know. I, I needed that growing up. You know, the reason I'm this way now, I hold mm -hmm. on to so much anger because I never was allowed to express those emotions. And so that struck a chord that I had no idea that needed to be discussed. And so when that video went viral, I got contacted by three Hollywood producers, uh, one of which was a gentleman named Roy Bank, who said, hey, man, I think this story needs to be told. Mm -hmm. Fast forward, him and he met with Lawrence Fishburne one day. So when Lawrence saw it, he was just blown away because of his desire for having a rite of passage for our community. And the rest was history. He and I became close like brothers. And um, he's, he's, he's definitely an advocate of what we do. And he sees the importance of helping a boy. He need, every young boy needs a mark in time where they say, you're no longer allowed to do childish things. That's right. And this is why we have so many grown men stuck in basements. Mm -hmm. Because we haven't gave them a ceremony and say, this, this village needs to now treat such and such like a man. He has put away childish things now and he is now to be treated and given responsibility. And so that's what our goal is in the cave is to create this comprehensive boy, mm -hmm. heal the boy so we can stop intergenerational trauma and and start intergenerational healing. Um, and First Corinthians 13, 11 too. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. sir. And what's beautiful is that um, the fathers, I say in every grown man is a broken boy inside. And Frederick Douglass says, uh, it's easier to raise children than it is to repair broken men. How That is very true. However, we should not leave men broken. Mm -hmm. And so I have a passion for mending men, uh, using the mat to heal the father and son relationship. Um, as, as men of our era, we grew up, we had to be tough. Don't cry, you know. Uh, that's, that shows, that's a sign of weakness. And many times when I have recruits doing something completely different, like uh, one instance, uh, we were just doing falls, break falls. And one of the young 
man was started crying. I'm like, what's wrong? And he kept looking at his dad. He looked back at me and he kept looking at his dad and his dad is a boxer, ex-boxer. And I called his father on the mat and I shared with him what's going on. Um, and he says, you know, he says, man, I pushed him way too hard. I said, well, share that with him. And I sat both of them on the side and they were just hugging each other and talking because he needed to share his wounds with his own son. And so mm -hmm. as long as a father uh, fears vulnerability, our sons will grow up and start repressing what they feel. And then the cycle of being like unavailable emotionally for our wives continues, you know, and, and I know so many good men, especially millennial men don't have mentors. And so they fear getting married because your Instagram profile is not your life. Mm -hmm. Eventually she's going to see that you worry. She's going right. to see that mm -hmm. you cry. You, you, yeah, you cry. You fear. You're yeah. fearful. Mm -hmm. You got a father wound or your, your mother wasn't there. And so as men, it's like, man, you know, they want to get their ducks in a row, which is admirable. Um, but I always ask them, when is the last time you seen ducks in a row? Mm -hmm. and, you know, I mean, seriously, you know, and, I, and our good friend, you know, uh, you know, we me and, actually we were outside talking to him and that was his reason for not marrying a woman he longed for. Because mm. he never saw no ducks in a row? No, he, <laughs> <laughs> he just wanted to have his finances, the house and everything. Yeah, and everything I get together. that. And that makes sense. But you about to lose this woman that you can get. And because he married her, they're doing great things right now. My wife and I got it together together. You know, we worked hard. She made more money than me. Oh, you got to say that again, Mr. Wilson. My, my, my wife and I got, got it, it together together. together. Oh, and man. so I, 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 wouldn't, I didn't want to lose my wife for my producing dreams. But because she made more money than me didn't make me less of a man, mm -hmm. less of a leader. I still led my home. I put her check in our bank account. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, my wife learned to, well, I learned to value myself more than from what I do. And that's why when I get approached by men, you know, I mean, doctors, lawyers come up to me crying, man, say, I don't feel valuable because we base everything on what we do instead of who we are. And that's why we work tirelessly. We adopted the grinding mentality, which is killing a lot of us. Now, let me and ask you a question. Yes. I, want, I want to go back to what you said, not to cut you off. I want, no, no, we lose it. Well, you did cut him off. <laughs> no, no, because I want to go back before because he's about to, to change. You were talking about the, the boxer gentleman, yeah. and he yeah. was talking about his son, and he said he was too hard on his son. Mm -hmm. now, now, how do you tell the people that come to the cave about pushing their child because we look at so many instances where a father pushes their child and then we see greats whether it's Beyonce or it's uh, Michael Jackson uh, and you see a lot of these greats but you also see it because they push their child to that limit mm -hmm. and you do understand that if, if that father didn't push that child we wouldn't have that so mm -hmm. so how do you blur that line you know mm -hmm. well depends on your definition of success mm -hmm. is it money and a lack of peace a lack of uh, having uh, true confidence that your parents really loved you. So I talked to a lot of successful people who families have pushed them, but yet they're struggling mentally right now because they didn't get the love. Mm, right. You see what I'm saying? And so it's like, you know, it's not even a fine line, you know? And so sometimes that pushing is abuse, brother. Mm. And um, I love Will Smith when he talked about it in his book about how his father was always tough love, drill sergeant, mm -hmm. I believe. And I tell fathers, there's a time for tough love. It's just not all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. Yes, I want to push my son academically or physically or whatever, uh, doing his chores, whatever it is, being responsible, saving money. However, I don't want that to be the basis of our relationship, that your success, a lot of times as parents, we use our children's success or failures, or we believe that defines who we are. Mm. Uh, one father last night who was in tears sharing how his son won't open up to him anymore. And, uh, and uh, he's actually uh, a counselor. And uh, he says, well, what do you do? I said, well, sometimes it's just best to be present. You can't be perfect, brother. Mm -hmm. And I told him, lay down next to your son. My son's 15. Sometimes he doesn't want to talk. I'm not leaving the room. I literally lay down on this floor so he can feel my presence and my love. And I let give him time because our kids need the space. But at the end of the day, man, I've seen, you know, this drill sergeant mentality destroy boys. Mm -hmm. You know, I, um, to that point, to Envy's point, uh, I, in therapy, I learned that, you know, a lot of times my father was parenting out of fear. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted mm -hmm. to learn how to do was parent out of love because mm -hmm. he was afraid that I would make the same mistakes that he did, mm -hmm. which I did, mm -hmm. you know, and he was a 
broken man mm. who was doing a lot of projecting on me mm. as well. Mm. And that that is wow. that's that's dangerous. Mm. You yes. know, it's, it's very dangerous. And I, I, you know, in all transparency, man, I messed up uh, in a major way raising my daughter that way. You know, disciplined dad, yelling because her room was dirty instead of talking to her like, why is it dirty? Right. What are you dealing with? Why can't these things be placed in the order? And my daughter had a lot of stuff going on and it hurts me today that I missed that mm. because of the way I was parented. My father was parented out of anger. You know, he loved me, but he would cuss me out, brother, if I click a switch the wrong way, you know? And so the key for me, and I tell all the parents is to parent out of love, you mm. know? and. More so, um, I remember, i never forget the time I was training my son in the basement with martial, uh, doing some martial arts. And Charlemagne, he says, uh, Dad, how did you become a great dad when your father wasn't? Mm. I said, son, I simply gave you what I longed for. Mm. And so what typically happens with fathers, we're desiring to do the, the right thing, but we're parenting from past trauma and, and, and past neglect or not having. So I say, don't live from what you lacked, live from what you longed for. Mm. So I told my son, I said, look, son, cause sometimes he missed the mark. I said, man, you could prove my theory wrong. I said, I'm gracious with you. If I know you got a lot of homework, I help you wash dishes. But that doesn't mean you don't try to ace that test tomorrow. That doesn't mean you don't give me your best. You don't take, it grant, uh, take advantage of this love that I'm giving you or comprehensive, uh, comprehensive fatherhood, mm -hmm. you take advantage of it. The fact that I don't have to yell at you just to convey a wrong that you've done, that we can talk through this. I can teach you how to verbally process how you feel so that you don't re repress those emotions and then it comes out with you getting a, fi a fight at school or you're disconnected in the class. And so I, I always tell parents to parent from love. Um, I don't like the, the motto of, you know, shut up and listen, I'm the parent. That's right. Um, no, allow you to say, oh, yeah, as I do exactly, especially when you're seeing that you, you're gonna learn from action, yes, you know what I mean. Yes. So, if I'm seeing you, if you're selling drugs, yeah, you can tell me how to sell <laughs> exactly. drugs, exactly. That's literally, that was me and my dad, yes, yeah. and, and, wow, that's deep. And even like some of the boys say, I see my dad do this and my mom do this, but yet they tell me not to do it. And so, as a parent, we're our children's greatest influence. We may think mm -hmm. it's the athletes, the rappers, statistically, that's not true. We're our children's greatest Absolutely. influence. I was going to ask you, so for, for a father listening right now, besides your book, mm -hmm. what book do you recommend or movie or documentary that can help, you know, maybe their child in, in, in their relationship or, or their situation or, or mm -hmm. even with, uh, you know, somebody that's not in Detroit, do mm -hmm. you, you know, recommend that maybe they join some type of martial arts or, mm -hmm. you know, what do you, what do you suggest? Well, um, as far as books, man, my foundation is the Bible. I'm not going, you know, that's my foundation. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't want to push my books, you know, um, but what I love about cry like a man, uh, and from the testimonies, um, it allows, I, I share my life in such a way where you can see yourself in it. Mm -hmm. And the truth be told, not too many people were talking about or are talking about escaping emotional incarceration, this safe space that appears like it's, it's protecting us, but mm -hmm. it's actually hindering, uh, hindering us from really living the lives that we longed for. Mm -hmm. And so, but um, as far as books, you know, the scriptures, um, I love Battle Cry as well. Um, Another Jason Wilson book. <laughs> yeah. I recommend those, I recommend yeah. Cry Like a Man, Battle Cry, the Unapologetic Guide to Black Mental Health yes, by Dr. Yes. Rita Walker. Um, Brother Ron, what's the one book you were reading about fatherhood? Um, the, Intentional Father. the Intentional Father. That's a great book. By John who? John Tyson. John Tyson. So that's a great that. book as well. Resume Minicum, uh, My Grandmother's Hands. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so um, as far as martial arts, um, again, if you're looking for what we do in the cave, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to find because Again, when most people join martial art academies, they're looking for this belt rank or to get skilled in fighting, not necessarily to become a comprehensive man or to deal with your own trauma. Um, but there are so many great martial art teachers that have the capacity to help you break free from that. You just have to allow them. Uh, my favorite uh, right now is Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Mm. Um, it makes you face your fears. So if you're a good striker, I can keep you off of me. But jujitsu to get good at it, you got to let a person in. And so often as men, we fear allowing men or anyone to have that space. Mm -hmm. So we keep a, a border up to keep people from coming in. Jujitsu uh, makes you face that. It makes you understand that you have to stay calm when 
someone is choking you or life is choking you. And so um, definitely um, I would suggest that for men who really, you know, are having some, some trauma or trauma issues or just issues of fear um, to, to find a, a reputable jujitsu school um, and with a great teacher and a patient teacher to help you walk through that. You know, you know what I love about God, man? Like you know, he's, he, God is the best knower and planner, right? Absolutely. You think about this, this film, you know, the, the cave of, I always pronounce it wrong. Adullam. Adullam, Adullam yes. The Cave of Adullam. Yes. Executive produced by Lawrence Fishburne. This probably could have went anywhere. Mm -hmm. But look where it ended up. Yes. ESPN, yes. the yes. worldwide leader in sports, mm -hmm. uh, a network that you know so many men mm -hmm. watch. Yes. Right? Like God put that doc exactly where it needed mm -hmm. to be for who needed to see it. Absolutely, man. And what's a blessing is when I get reached out to by NBA players or f football players to see their transparency and wanting to grow, wanting to become better husbands and better fathers and better individuals, man, it just makes the 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 hard work, the blood, sweat, and literally the tears worth it. Um, because, you know, we'll see the cars, the fame, mm -hmm. top 75 in history, but yet they're struggling behind the scenes. Right. They're hurting. They want to save their marriage. They want to be more patient. They don't want to yell at their kids because they're running late at school, you know, for school. And so to be able to be a source of encouragement, uh, somewhat like a spiritual father to them all, and then for them to watch the Cave of a Dollar do Cave of a Dullum documentary, and see themselves in one of those boys, mm -hmm. and to finally have that healing cry, to say, "Wow, I've been holding on a lot of this pain of how my father would always condemn me when I would make a mistake, or my mother was emotionally checked out because my brother was murdered, and I never really got that nurturing love." And then to get that healing and then to go back to your father and say, hey, dad, I forgive you. I love you. Can we start fresh now? Or mom, I completely understand why you guarded your heart because of the mm -hmm. heaviness or the brokenness of you losing our, my brother and your son. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of the cave documentary. It, it showcases that although as a people uh, in our communities, we experience a lot of trauma. It doesn't have to be our experience, but our entire experience. What is um, What has been the most impactful medium of messaging you know whether it's clips going viral or the, the film or our books what do you think hits people the most um i would say clips going i would say both brother because mm -hmm. i i've uh i mean just yesterday men crying i'm standing up for hours signing books right. and and audio books are i didn't realize how many people listen to audio books oh, yeah. so i'm so glad i read Absolutely. battle cry um Brother, I just I think it's a combination of both. I was in the gym one day and a Romanian man comes up to me and I, you know, I love wrestling and I I, I could tell I look at the ears and I say, Yeah, he's, he's a wrestler, right? Yeah. Right, right, right. And so he comes up to me, his eyes are bloodshot. And he says, Man, uh I, I don't want to interrupt you what you're doing, so but I had to share with you your books and everything, man, has truly changed my life. And he got choked up, he hit his chest and just walked off. And so to know that I had that type of impact that me transparently sharing my story is allowing men of all ethnicity to break free from this emotional bondage and stop suffering in silence. Social media, mm -hmm. uh, a brother reached out to me, was about to kill himself. Mm. And I get so many direct messages, but this one, the most I say, I need you to open this one. Yes, it's gonna take your night away. You won't be able to rest, you need to call him. I said, give me your number, I'm gonna call you right now. Called his brother, he's in Canada, crying, uh, very traumatic past. I called my psychotherapist. He says, I won't charge him. Give me his number, I call him tomorrow. He spent three hours with him on FaceTime and saved his life. Mm. Wow. And so wow. the impact of the wow. books and media, uh, uh, it's been more impactful right now than even having this beautiful documentary out mm -hmm. because more people scroll on social right. media. And it's, it's imperative that, you know, that's why I love what you do, brother. I mean, for you to use your platform to increase our aware, awareness of mental health in our community is, is, is needed mm -hmm. and it's commendable mm -hmm. because brothers are on the verge. Um, as you know, we die by suicide three times as likely as women. Mm -hmm. And we don't live long as, as women either. Nine out of 10 people who live to be over 100 are women. And so um, it's imperative that this message is uh, broadcast on, on every uh, form of media as possible. Um, because again, like right now, it's a brother ready to jump. Mm -hmm. Philly isn't good enough, uh, never could measure up.
Mm-hmm. And and that's uh, due to, um, I, I think, men not being, uh, uh, having the emotional freedom to really be human. We're locked into just doing mm-hmm. instead of just being. I, I want to go back to something you said earlier because, uh, you know, NBA Youngboy just did an interview with Billboard and he expressed the same thing. And I've heard a lot of people express this. I've expressed it myself, you know, just as far as, you know, the content that we may have created as we were growing mm-hmm. and, and, and evolving. And, you know, you was talking about the music and I'm like, how much, we should give ourselves a lot of grace in regards to the music we used to create or even the content we used to create because we literally were doing the, the best with what we had and we were in survival mode. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I'm the type of person, I feel like you gotta give people grace when they're doing what they feel like they need to do to survive. Um, uh, not necessarily. Mm-hmm. And what I mean, I can use my brother for example. He sold drugs because he needed. He thought that's what he needed to do to, to survive. Mm-hmm. Uh, as a result, a lot of people lost their lives. Mm-hmm. So I can't really, you know, celebrate that. Um, Not celebrate that, but once he knew better, he started doing better. No, he didn't. Oh man! Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, he died a terrible death, mm-hmm. um, and uh, he didn't do better. And so again, I didn't come out um, because I just I knew I knew I was wrong. Mm-hmm. I knew I shouldn't have been doing what I was doing with my gift, but it was those two near death experiences that changed me. Now I do get what you're saying. Have enough grace in yourself to not condemn yourself for some wrong that you've done. Mm-hmm. Forgive yourself and move forward. But we still have to acknowledge that what we were doing was wrong. I agree. And, and that's the key. If not, you know, the next generation will keep doing it. And then the next generation, and we came up in what they consider the golden era of hip hop, mm-hmm. you know? And so, you look at the covers. I was just sharing this with the young kids uh, yesterday. None of the rappers, I love Smile Out on the album cover. Mm-hmm. And so we call it uh, asset framed marketing. So now in the cave, if you look at the first class picture, everyone was tough. Now all of my boys smile because it's imperative that we change this narrative. And so what's wrong with smiling? You know, you, you, which you don't want to be perceived as a joke. Mm-hmm. You know, I know guys that are smile that you wouldn't stand one minute with them in a ring or in, in a, on a mat. It does not dictate who you are as a man. So I want to be compassionate, but I also want to be courageous. I want to be sensitive, but I want to be strong. And so that's what I want to model for boys and men, because at the end of the day, none of us want to stay in what I call like lion mode or fight mm-hmm. or flight where you got to be grimming all the time and tough looking over your shoulder. I have to be that way when I have to be, but I want to live in the lamb. I want to be at peace. I want to chill in the green pastures as long as I can. However, when a predator comes or a threat comes, the lion will arise and defend the pride. Mm -hmm. And that's the importance of us as men to model that even in the hip hop culture, like a lot of rappers that reach out to me, I was like a fan of. And so it blesses me to hear them say, man, I really respect what you're doing and I want to become that type of man. And as you know, from the survival standpoint in hip hop, many of us did what we had to do to eat, but a lot of that was in a dream. We mm-hmm. want to be rich. We want to be paid. Right. And, and truth be told in, in Detroit, the majority of drug dealers I knew, they didn't have to sell drugs. Yeah. Sold drugs because it, you got props from it. You got mm-hmm. women. You got the cars. It wasn't a necessity to eat. But that, that all comes from a place of lack, right? Not necessarily lack of finances. The, lack of it, lack affirmation. Of, yes, yeah, for yeah, my yeah, brother yeah, feeling yeah. special, yeah. celebrating that. Yeah. And so my brother wasn't starving. But when his friends pulled up in a BMW, he's working at a gas station pumping the gas, and the girl he liked was in the car, and they all laughed at him and pulled off. He vowed he would that would never happen to him again. Mm-hmm. And when I said never happened to him again. It never happened to him again. But unfortunately, he's not here to see his daughter's life. Right. You see what I'm saying? Absolutely. I, I, do we? Yeah. Ray, can you? I wonder if we can play that NBA Young Boy clip. Can you play it from the board right now? I, I, lo- I just want you to hear I it. I would love to. Yeah, I really you. want you to hear it just because, like, he said some things in there that I was like, I feel him. And mm. I understand what, mm. what what he's going through. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I know why he's in that place he is because mm-hmm. he hasn't dealt with, you know, I would love to hear that. Childhood or whatever. Yeah, and that's you got it. You play it. Yeah. I'm terrified of people, and I'm very shy. But I never know why. Once I walk on the stage, I would get it done. I'm terrified of people. People are cruel. Now you can't control all stuff, so you never know what someone will do you. 
I always wanted to be a rapper. It's always my dream. I never had a plan B. Can't be on top forever. You know, I will not be provoked. I will, and I'm not going back to who I used to be. Mm. I only get more groovy from here. Mm. Wow. You get a pain in that brother's voice. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, you know, again, I don't, I don't condemn, I want to be clear. I don't condemn, uh, where these rappers are right now. You know, I look at them as my sons. Um, and I can't say their name and when they reach out, I'll be like, I'm here for you, mm -hmm. you know, call me. And that's the scariest step for many of them. It's like, man, okay, here's a man who's finally willing to engage in my life. But that fear of taking that first step to healing. Mm -hmm. um, I had a, a, a UFC fighter come visit me and uh, literally we talk in one day. I said, well, look, just come see me, man, if it's that heavy. He said, I'm there in the morning, 6 a.m. So he flew in for the first time and he's met with therapists before. I had him write out all of his past trauma mm. and he looked at it and broke down crying mm. in my chair and hit in the chair in the office. Champion fighter. Never was able to face that. And so one of our greatest fears as men is dealing with ourselves. That's why we can't sit in a room when it's quiet. We got to always be on the phone or smoking or doing something, drinking. But when you can put all of that aside and just sit still, no matter if it's shaking you to the core and ready to face it, then you can start healing. And so just hearing that brother's voice, you know, it's he needs deliverance. He needs healing and he first needs compassion and love. Like, this is a safe space, young brother. Let's get all of this out of you so you can finally live. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what, you know, I, I pray that uh, people would see from my life who I am. Um, man, you know, uh, I only got so much time here. You know, I'm 53 years old. And you look good, brother. You thank you. Good. Thank you. I want to leave my cup empty. And um, I, I want to be a source of healing for us. And that's what I desire. Um, it hurts me when I see men who look successful to the world, uh, but inside they feel like losers. Their lives are falling apart. And because everyone is performance-based, everyone mm -hmm. is gimme, 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 mm -hmm. their entire text message is just people asking for money. Mm -hmm. Ooh. It's, 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 <laughs> it's heart-rending and... Uh, that's why I choose to use my platform in such a way where I'm not perfect. I strive for excellence. I used to strive for perfection, but on my desk right now is a plaque that says excellentist because that's all I can strive for. I can't be a perfectionist. And I want people to see my life, uh, even with my wife and I, you know, 25 years this year wasn't an easy journey. No infidelity, no gambling, no just misuse of finances we just didn't get along we would the years of just me being negative to her or her years of not trusting me um and 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 to give men so they can see like man i don't have to yell to convey mm -hmm. that i'm upset like no if you our base emotion for all men that we've mastered expressing is anger but it's never the root cause of what's ha really right. happening That's and right. Um, I can give a recent example, which was uh, kind of funny. Uh, we we're in counseling, marital counseling, and our therapist was like, okay, since no one is mind readers, Nicole, you ask Jason what you would like, one thing, and then Jason, you ask her what you would like. So my wife says, well, Jay, when you come home, I would love for you to acknowledge me first instead of going to little Jay. I said, okay, I'll do that. And then he says, what about you, Jay? And so I'm sitting there inside of me. I'm like, my, I wish you would just submit to me, submit to my leadership, mm -hmm. you know, stop bucking against what I say. That's the flesh, that's anger. But what I really was feeling was like, it hurts because she doesn't trust me. And so I turned to Nicole, I said, hey, um, I would like for you to trust me. And she just shook her head and she knew exactly what I was saying because that was from my heart. Mm -hmm. The anger is never really the real issue. And I, I have to tell men, yeah, anger, uh, the scriptures say, be angry, but do not sin. There's a fine line. It's a great power if used correctly. However, when we really dig deep to what's really going on underneath that anger and express that, that's when we can really communicate with the women in our lives. If we're always dogmatic, 
if someone's swinging at me, I'm putting my hands up. Mm -hmm. If you're swinging, you're, you're in a dogmatic mode, your wife or the woman in your life, she's going to do this. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you say, babe, you know, that really hurts that every time I make a decision or give an idea to something, you always counter it. Like almost like my mom, like you scared I'm going to make a mistake that's going to destroy this home. Mm -hmm. When you convey it that way and say it really hurts me as a man, I'm trying to do my best. I didn't have this example, but I'm just trying to set a standard for our home. My wife started doing this, and then eventually she just dropped her guard and opened her heart for me. And I had to do the same way, same thing, because our women also have to unlearn society's definition of a man as well. Mm -hmm. So just like we ask for grace for, from them, we got to give them grace as well to unlearn what they've been deceived to believe a man is. Absolutely. Well, damn, a lot of knowledge. Appreciate you man, for joining Mr. us, Jason brother. Wilson. Thank you, brother. Thank Jason you for Wilson. Make sure you go get Battle Cry. Go mm -hmm. get Cry Like a Man. Order them on Amazon, wherever you buy books now. Make sure you watch uh, The Cave. I'm mispronounce it again. The Cave of Adullam. The Cave of Adullam. You know, it's on, is it streaming on ESPN? Or? ESPN Plus. Okay. And then uh, it randomly airs on ESPN. So I appreciate ESPN doing that just to get it out. And we're also doing like live screenings of the film. And then we have a fireside chat for social and emotional learning for students so they can see State the value. In, yes, mm -hmm. so they can uh, see the value in expressing their emotions before uh, they become toxic thoughts. And right. follow him on social media. Yes, Mr. Mr. Jason O. Wilson. All right. Yeah. Well, it's Jason, Jason Wilson. It's the Always Breakfast a pleasure, Club. brother. I love Thank you, my man. brother. I love, I love Absolutely. you, and I yes, value you, and I appreciate you, Thank man. You, brother. Love Thank you, brother. Love you, and I appreciate you, too. All righty, come on.